guys, what's going on? Welcome to episode 193 of Bite That's Wrestling Podcast, a semi-somewhat, maybe international maybe. professional wrestling podcast where we talk about what is going on in the world of WWE. You can check us out every single Wednesday night. We're available on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, now on SoundCloud as well. And of course, you can check out our YouTube youtube.com slash bite that cast with this podcast and other content as well we'd like Ooh. to thank everyone for joining us and we'd especially like to thank some of our supporters including nicole Torado, Derek wilson and peter d if you'd like to go the extra mile in supporting what we do you can head over to bite that.com uh, patreon.com Patreon. bite that. you can also find it at bite that.com it's true uh, it's for, a one-stop shop yeah. really so patreon.com slash bite that. All the details and the best way to support us is all there. My name is Ryan McNelty. I hail from Boston, Massachusetts. And joining me today, Keith Poshik from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Keith, Hello. how you doing? I am doing quite shabby, if I say so myself. So uh, I notice I notice you're hosting, Ryan. Normally we have another guy that does that. What uh, What happened to him? Well, uh, it appears that Juan had a uh, had a commitment, so we are down to a two man show. You know, we, we like always the, say the show the must go on. Two crew this week, so we wish Juan good luck with his commitment and his and, future endeavors. And no, 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 no. <laughs> we we need Juan. Okay. <laughs> you know what? We we like to joke, but he is the captain of our ship. So oh, let's absolutely. try not to get let's try not to just get lost at sea this week. Yeah, we're, we'll try not to go off the rails. I don't mind doing a host every every now and then now and again. But one one very much steers the ship and uh, we we do need our captain. So best of luck, one. We hope to see you next week as that is the plan. So <laughs> going in to our agenda we got right. we got things to talk about. We get, we're going to talk about some payback. We're going to talk about what was going on with Raw and SmackDown this week. But I'm just going to open with this and, and give me a moment to just throw this at you so that it can fully sink in. All right. I'm going to give it a moment to breathe here. Yes. Whatever words are going to come out of your mouth, they're going to get to really just sit there on the table yes and just kind of hang yeah they got hang wwe low, network is bringing it to the table i'm bringing something to the table right now hang low very low great balls of fire 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 <laughs> Keith? Yeah, Keith. That's a thing, isn't it? So, wow. is this is this the worst pay per view name of all time, Keith? Go worst or best? That is my question. It's uh, it was shocking. At, so this, let me let me go through my thought process here when I originally saw this. At first, I saw WWE announces great balls of fire. And I thought to myself, oh, hey, KFAB News got an article that or like that got a lot of traffic. Good for it. Those guys are awesome. And then I saw it was real. And then I had to slap myself to make sure that I wasn't sleeping because, wow, why? Why is this of all the names of all the names? This is like WCW levels of something. I don't know if it's good. I don't know if it's bad. But great balls of fire! This is a different pay per view gracious. name, <laughs> right? Is that not yeah. the most appropriate thing to go with? Yeah. So this will be a pay per view in July for Raw. This is going to be a Raw, Raw brand show, and it is advertised as the first title defense that Brock Lesnar is going to have. Now, of all names, I, I think this is actually replacing Bad Blood. There were rumors that the Bad Blood pay-per-view was coming back, and the name somehow was changed. Is Bad Blood, is Blood now just completely not family-friendly? We got Roman Reigns coughing up blood onto a damn wall, but we can't name our pay-per-view Bad Blood? I mean, like, in reality, you're trading balls of fire for blood, so it's not like it's any better, because you've got fire and inanimate objects, I'm at least I'm hoping, on fire. But, you know, those balls are potentially great, so we don't know where what There's the origin is. There's some great is. balls, let me tell you. 
Yeah, I mean, you look at other pay-per-view names. I really can't, like, when I heard this, I think it might have been, like, Friday. I was just freaking out, like, tweet, like, I was retweeting a bunch of stuff. I was making memes. Like, I just couldn't get over it. And I still haven't gotten over the fact of just how bad of a pay-per-view name it is. Really, like, we've had pay-per-views like Fatal 4-Way, Taboo Tuesday. Capital Punishment. Yeah, Capital Punishment, Cyber Sunday, Over the Limit, Fast lanes, not even that great. Roadblock, end of the line. But all, every single one of those, I can like see an angle where I'm like, you know what? It's, okay. it's passable. Okay. Cause like Fatal 4 Way, all right, there's a bunch of Fatal 4 Way matches. It, it makes sense. Fast lane, I guess. Like it You're feels on the like road it's to something... WrestleMania. It kind of makes sense. Yeah. It feels great like, you know, Capital Punishment. It's talking about like, <laughs> there's some sort of violence kind of in plot and it was in uh it was in washington dc as yeah, well exa- if i remember even, exactly. correctly so it's punishment in the capital but great balls of fire <laughs> there's nothing there's nothing if, uh, it's just a it's like a 50 year old song so i don't know has vince mcmahon lost uh, it probably Who knows? There's good, like in the wwe i think there's a lot of examples right now of both in the good way and the bad way, dumb. There's a lot of dumb things happening in wrestling right now, both good dumb and bad dumb. This falls under bad dumb in a serious way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what you said, Keith, could really just be applied to WWE almost forever. (laughs) There's either good, dumb or bad, dumb going on constantly. But there's some real good, dumb happening right now. Yes, yes. And we are thankful for that. So moving on to WWE Payback, which was this Sunday, uh, this past Sunday, rather, we we all went in with it with hype levels at, at a pretty low point. I did my full review over on the YouTube channel, if you guys want to check that out. Um, but I, I did want to hear Keith's take. So Payback ended up being not quite as uh, as bad as everyone thought it was going to be. No, not at all. Um, like we kind of mentioned last week, our expectations going into Payback were super low. It was very, oh, we just need to get this over with. But Payback was a really good show. It um had some really good matches, for sure. Uh, the standout either being the Cruiserweights or, depending on your outlook, the House of Horrors match. Because, like, boy, that, boy, <laughs> that, that stood out. That was a little out. polarizing. Yeah, yeah I think there was an excellent, excellent tag match, too, with the Hardys. Agreed. Um, Braun Strowman and Roman Reigns definitely delivered. The The women's match definitely delivered. Overall, it was a really good pay-per-view. And um, yeah, it was it was good. So, all right. House of Horrors. Let's just get let's into just, it. Let's just get I, right I gave my it. take on it. You know, I, I to, to sum up in what I said in my review, I pretty much said that it, it didn't really land for me because something like the final deletion had that sense of humor to it it wasn't taking itself seriously whereas this was something trying to do something similar but be taken completely serious with the spooky scary skeletons and all that so how did you feel about it keith i couldn't stop laughing throughout that match and i loved it so much because it was so so lame with the whole oh hey let's set off neon lights in the rooms that they're not gonna go into because they're spooky scary or there's dolls in this room or randy orton's gonna get killed by a fridge or something like that it was just a bunch of really good dumb moments and i was super into it from that i am I didn't expect much out of the House of Horror match really going into it. And if it's one of those things that you can't look too deep into it or else you're going to start finding like cracks in both the logic and the yeah the actual match itself. That was the actual the house part. Once they got back to the arena, I hated what happened. I will go as far as saying I hated what happened. The way that Bray Wyatt won that match, I thought was awful. The fact that, like, if this is his match and he can't even win it cleanly really bugged me. I understand the whole, you know, SmackDown, uh, furthering the plot with gender thing, whatever. But you're going to finally give Bray one and you can't let him fully have the one. There's, um, 
If you go back and watch Payback, there's a shot right at the end of the match that I think perfectly personifies Bray Wyatt. And it's when Jinder's leaving the ring and Bray looks all puzzled, like, what am I, am I, am I going to get this win? And it's, it's a shot that has stuck with me the entire time. And, uh, it, uh, it, it really bummed me out. But they, the overall, I guess the House of Horrors match, the house part was, that was good dumb. That was real good dumb. Yeah, so I guess, to, you know, it's one of those things that is just polarizing. People either appreciated the dumbness of it or they thought it was the worst thing ever. And also, um, sorry to cut you off there, but Bray Wyatt should never wear a white tank top ever again because it basically exponentially increases the amount of hillbilly he looks <laughs> when he's uh, You when know, he's I actually kind of liked the look for the occasion. I mean... Essentially, Randy Orton's going into a crack house, so you gotta you gotta have <laughs> Bray Wyatt look the part. You know what I'm saying? I guess so. Man, yeah, there's no, some I, good I there's some good like, screenshots of them in like crack house levels. Yes, yeah. like I didn't appreciate that it was segmented into oh, like we're gonna do this part, then we're gonna have a match in between, and conveniently Bray Wyatt's gonna show up right after that other match had ended. Uh, people were talking about how. It was nighttime during the House of Horrors, yet in California, it still wasn't even dark out yet. So yeah, there was like some they didn't, they didn't even bother addressing that. Like, hey, the House of Horrors has to be like 30 minutes driving distance from the arena, yeah. right? Because they had to get to the limo But somehow. I mean, if we're going to poke holes in the House that, of Horrors match said, about, don't about look, the time don't look. of day, why not talk about how... Oh, man, it, it wasn't the right time of day, but I'm going to just accept the fact that a tractor moved backwards on its own. <laughs> you know, I'll, we'll, we'll or Randy Orton slide. wore pants. And we're just yeah. going to let all that or that slide. Yeah. So completely rid ridiculous. Um, it, yeah. W the way they chopped it up into two, it really it, it killed the crowd, I think. I mean, really, they just they were That's booing the match it before really it even happened. crappy for a live crowd because. Yeah. It, it reminded me a lot of, do you remember that Raw from years ago where uh, the trial of Eric Bischoff happened and most of that crowd had to see that show like pre like pre recorded video on the Titan Tron? It made me think of that a lot and just how crappy that was for uh, the live crowd because you're paying to see live wrestling and hey, now you have to look at this video package for 20 minutes. It's a it's a weird it's a weird thing to crack, but it's I can totally see why they would boo that. Yeah, no, completely. So I, I mean, it, it. I just think for the most part that that match really didn't land. It, it was not something we're gonna remember fondly. And even Jerry Lawler was pretty open about it. Not only on Raw Talk, but apparently he spoke in another po podcast. Just he doesn't give a damn. He's like, he didn't like it. It didn't really do anything for him. So yeah, the, we're just glad that it's over, um, and we can move on. That was yep. uh, that was kind of the theme of payback, except it ended up being a surprisingly better show than we all expected. It helps when expectations are very low to be pleasantly surprised. So uh, what Roman a dark Reigns, sentence. Roman what a Reigns very and dark. Braun Strowman. Hell of a match. It, it played out pretty much as we expected, where the angle would be, hey, Roman Reigns, he's not 100%, so this is a great opportunity for Strowman to get a big win while also having an out for Roman Reigns. What would you think? I'm incredibly happy it played out like that. It's uh, it's really best case scenario because eventually Reigns is going to come back and he's going to rule the mountain. So this gives him a way to like either take a, take a sidestep for a while and be quote-unquote injured and Braun to really build or build momentum, especially if he's going to uh, go up and face Brock Lesnar at Great Balls of Fire. Great Balls of Fire. That's going to be so fun to say that for the next while. But <laughs> yeah, overall, great match. My favorite thing probably ever happened on Raw Talk afterwards involving those two where Braun Strowman. Did you catch any of Raw oh, Talk, yes. by the way? Yeah, no, when I Braun actually Strowman watched... just went right through a freaking yes. ambulance door. Probably my favorite thing that's happened in a very long time. It is the best. Yeah, no, it, it's amazing what Braun Strowman has. He's become the highlight of Monday Night Raw. I know he wasn't on this week. I don't think him or Roman were on Raw this week. But we got we got a lot of Strowman this weekend, and it's just amazing. He's a human wrecking ball. He's a human wrecking ball. Yeah, 
the f- the fact that he just can't help but never stop beating the crap out of Roman Reigns is just it, it brings a smile to many people's faces, including my own. Uh, so, yeah, it doesn't appear that this feud is done. Kurt Angle implied. No. Looks like we could be heading towards a, an ambulance match at uh, maybe it's probably going to be on Raw because I don't know. Is the next Raw pay-per-view really going to be great balls of fire? Or are we too far away from that? When when is the it's going to be in uh, early July? So we got backlash happening, I think, at the end of May. So, so that there's leaves the June, June pay per view. Yeah, I don't know what the hell is going on with June. So is Extreme Rules still a thing? Yeah, uh, you know what? Probably. So there so, there might be Extreme Rules, which would make sense to have something like an ambulance match. I'll be interested to see if they have. Braun beat Roman twice then or if they're going to if that's going to be Roman's big comeback and then maybe he faces Lesnar right great balls of fire yeah we're we're in an interesting scenario because it really comes down to how soon do they want to use the Reigns versus Lesnar card they could they could save it to Wrestlemania if they wanted to and Braun Strowman wins the ambulance match or i kind of hope they don't save it to wrestlemania though honestly because yeah. it's going to be this looming thing over the whole year it would be very reminiscent of the cm punk rock kind of yep. inevitable thing that was going to happen where it was even though cm punk was champion you knew exactly when he was going to lose it and you knew the rock was going to lose it to cena and mania you knew the whole thing by the fall yeah so if they carry out this Roman Reigns, Brock Lesnar thing all the way out to WrestleMania. We know Lesnar is going to keep the title till then. And every it makes every single title feud completely meaningless, even if there's probably only going to be like three if Brock Lesnar stays champion. And that, that definitely would hurt the Raw brand significantly. I mean, you can already feel like with Monday Night Raw, there are so many guys on this show and you're like, what the hell do you do with all these people without the universal title or the champion on the show? Like they have, we have to do so, they actually have to be creative for once to figure out like what the heck to do with half of these guys. They're going to get a lot of mileage out of that Intercontinental Championship. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing a huge boost in emphasis on both mid card titles right now, which I mean is a pretty good thing, but it does still just feel weird when you don't have the main champion on the show. So you know what? It's like, I, I would hope. At this point, as as much as I want to see Strowman continue his path of destruction, it's almost like just just give Reigns the title so that we can move on with our lives, you know? Agreed. So moving on to uh, to Monday Night Raw itself, uh, Sheamus and Cesaro, they uh, they have been playing nice for quite a while with the Hardys, but finally we had a turn, and. Now we have a heel, Sheamus and Cesaro. It doesn't take much for the crowd to buy into a Sheamus heel turn. Cesaro, uh, but Cesaro, he, it's been a while since he's been a heel. It's true. And, you know, probably a blessing because we were saying for a while there that raw the Raw tag team division needed more heels. So if you look at the people that this makes the most sense for, yeah, that's probably going to be Sheamus and Cesaro. But, man, I... I see this ending in obscurity, in complete honesty, especially when the Revival are healthy and ready to come back. Like, if there was a situation where Sheamus, is, or Sheamus and Cesaro take a backseat, this is probably it. I'm sure they'll have some great matches, especially with the Hardys, but I see it being a very temporary thing. Yeah, it's unfortunate that the whole Sheamus and Cesaro chance was just a one night thing at the raw after wrestlemania i would have liked to see that continue do you think Uh, there was like a meeting like they're building momentum turn them heel (laughs) i'm not so sure what the plan was because you gotta think the revival could have been in the mix before the whole uh injury happened to to dash his jaw so that really kind of created this hole where they're like okay we need more heel tag team so that could have been sort of the catalyst for this Sheamus and Cesaro heel turn. But I, I, I think it's a good thing. It it wasn't going to help and it wasn't going to really work out for them too well if they were just going to keep playing nice. Like now the fans are into the Hardys as the babyface team. So if Sheamus and Cesaro want to stay relevant 
they probably get a turn heel. So I think I I thought it was good to see. I mean, um, let's be honest here with the way that the tag team division is probably one way or another. It doesn't end well for the team of Sheamus and Cesaro. Probably so not. And why not try something new? Yeah, it's pretty much. Hey, Cesaro, maybe someday they'll send you to SmackDown and you can you can do something because it is it's quite crowded on Raw right now. Uh, moving on to the Raw Women's Division, we had uh, Alexa Bliss, who did win the Raw Women's Championship against Bailey at Payback. She became the first woman, not Charlotte, Alexa Bliss became the first woman to win the SmackDown Women's title and the Raw Women's title. Very interesting. And had her coronation or celebration on Raw. She had a, she had a nice little heel promo. Got uh got ba- Bailey all riled up and got knocked off the stage. But uh, I have to say, Alexa Bliss has just been killing it. Like every anytime they give her a microphone, she shines. And she had probably one of her best matches ever against Bailey at Payback. So she's really on fire right now. Uh, what do you think? Uh, you know your whole your thoughts on the whole Alexa Bliss situation so far on Raw? I agree with everything you said. Where she is on fire and. I'm very surprised that she uh, she was the first one to win both women's championships, but it's not an unwelcome surprise. All that being said, I did not like this coronation ceremony bit on Raw one bit. It was it was very hard to believe that all of the Raw women would just sit there and be okay with it for the duration that they were before everything broke out, especially with Bailey losing the championship the uh, the night uh, before. It all felt very like, okay, when are you going to get to them all getting beaten down? Like Alexa was doing great work on the microphone there, don't get me wrong, but the whole situation itself was really hard to get past for me and uh, wasn't wasn't a big fan of it. What, that they would just all sit there and kind of get trashed on and be okay with it? Exactly. Because you have, like, you've had people that have been fighting for the title for months there with, like, Sasha, even Nia Jax. Nia Jax is this person that they're building to give zero, like, to give zero shits and just take people out. But she's okay to just stand there and, oh, I'm going to give Alexa a dirty look and, and that's it. Like, she should have, like, she probably should have crushed Bliss for the things that she was saying. Yeah, it's true. I mean, things like this, even though you know what they're trying to do, it feels like, unsurprisingly, that WWE doesn't really consider character in how, like, they don't consider, oh, how would Nia Jax actually react during the situation? It's more like... It's how, it's conveniency. Yeah, they're just like, okay, we need to get to the point where Bailey knocks Alexa off the little platform and then a brawl ensues. Or even just like the little things like Emma and Dana Brooke, how they've been. Well, they were anyway, like kind of having that back and forth. Like, you should join up with me. No, I want to do my own thing. We're going to kind of feud, I guess. But let's stand right beside each other in this coronation ceremony. Like, move one of them to the other side of the the women or something like that. It's uh, yeah, no, it was one that of those Alexa little things. Alexa was like, oh, Bailey, how could I forget you? And she completely didn't even talk about Emma or Dana Brooke. So that right. just shows like how irrelevant she thinks they are, which is, <laughs> which is sad. But yeah, they really just kind of you can you can like sense yourself in the writing room just going, OK, they're just thinking about we need to get to this point and let's work backwards from here. We just have everybody sit out there. You know, we need to get to Bailey attacking Alexa Bliss, knocking her off the platform, and then everybody starts brawling each other without considering what this would actually mean for any other character. They're just kind of pawns in this segment that we're just trying to get this one thing to happen. And Like there's nothing that they wouldn't, like that segment wouldn't have lost anything if they just had Alexa out there by herself and And Bailey Bailey came out. out. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I completely agree. And that's that's not just this segment, but that has just been for a very long time uh, an ongoing problem of just, you know, characters, how they react. It's depending on what the segment it is, they'll act differently. And there's no there's not a lot of consistency with characters. Uh, But Raw got one of the best main events in a no very, kidding. very long time, we had a Holy triple cow. threat match for the number one contendership for Dean Ambrose's Intercontinental title. Ambrose was actually pretty entertaining this uh, 
he brought some of his SmackDown Live uh, silliness to Raw, pretending to be uh, an announcer and uh, giving Finn Balor a donut because he needed to eat some carbs. So, I, you know, I actually appreciated some of the, hum- uh, the humor from Ambrose because sometimes Raw takes itself a little too seriously. I, I thought that was a nice touch. And, you know, so, goofy Dean Ambrose sometimes does really land and is really funny. It uh, does, but it has a very short tightrope or a very yeah. thin tightrope to walk because it can he, go bad he, in a heartbeat. That he walks. Sometimes it gets a little too much. I thought this was a good balance uh, on Raw this week. Um, so we had Finn Balor versus Seth Rollins versus The Miz for uh, the number one contendership for the Intercontinental title. Damn. Just damn. damn. What a ma- Not only what a match, but the way that by the end of this match, you knew exactly where every feud, every main feud on Raw was going and how they played that all out was spectacular. I can't give them enough credit for the way this match played out. It was so good. Yeah, I mean, so many false finishes that it just kept going. You thought it was over so many times it kept going. By the time the interferences happened, it was just so chaotic that you just, I, I personally. You just accepted it. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I bought into it because I'm just like, I can't believe it's not over. And then boom, Joe shows up and you're like, oh my God, it's going to be over. No, there's Bray Wyatt. It was just so much chaos. And of all people, The Miz ends up winning the match when if you looked at that match on paper you'd be like oh the Miz has There's no, no chance way. but so I'm so we... happy I'm yeah. so happy that the Miz won that match because I think honestly if you had either Seth Rollins or Finn Balor win it you would have this situation where people would look at both Raw and Smackdown and see them doing the exact same thing because AJ Styles basically won the same type of match to become number one contender and if you had Seth Rollins or Finn in that position as number one contender it would be like, okay, they're trying to do what AJ Styles is doing on SmackDown, but with The Miz, it becomes this different thing, and I can really appreciate that. Yeah, and The Miz is someone who needs to be in that spot of going for the Intercontinental title, which is kind of technically the top title on Raw right now. And at least the one that's going to show up. First pinfall on Raw happened from The Miz. <laughs> yeah. Who would have thought that? I didn't even think of that, actually. That's a good point. But yeah, The Miz is the one you're like, you're a little worried about on Raw. How is he going to stay relevant? So I think it's nice that he was the one who ended up going into the Intercontinental title feud. And the, and the feud between Ambrose and The Miz had been something that's been brewing for the past couple of weeks anyway. And then we had Bray Wyatt pairing off against Finn Balor, which was something that was teased uh, a couple of weeks ago. So that should be interesting. And obviously, Joe and Rollins, it doesn't appear that that feud is quite over. So all these feuds going on, which ones you like and which ones are you not so crazy about? Uh, Just to kind of go down uh, through all of them, Finn and Bray Wyatt's kind of whatever, but that's no fault of Finn there. It's (laughs) more like, I'm, you know what, they're going to give Finn a win. He's going to beat Bray Wyatt. I'm pretty much on your level, Ryan, where it's kind of whatever with Bray anymore. Yeah, did you uh, see the video that someone made where it showed a Bray Wyatt promo? And then him losing? And then him losing immediately. Oh, that's a great video. uh, That sums up Bray Wyatt well. And that's why I'm not very excited about this feud at all. But you know what? It gives Finn something to do while they sort the whole Brock Lesnar thing out. So that's, that's good in itself. And then as... For Samoa Joe and Seth Rollins, that's probably the one I'm the most excited about because they had a really good match at Payback, at least I think so. And those two can go. And if they just like if their whole feud is, hey, we're going to have great matches, that's all I need from it. And um, it gives Samoa Joe a chance to establish himself and establish his character on the main roster because Seth Rollins is probably one of the best people on the roster right now at selling maybe only like beaten by AJ Styles and his ability to sell strong moves. So if he just becomes a ragdoll for Samoa Joe's moveset, that's great as far as I'm concerned. And uh, for the last one, Ambrose and Miz, intellect or like uh, from an academic standpoint, that's probably the one that I'm the most interested in seeing what happens because like we mentioned with Ambrose, there's just uh, with that fine line, I think that can also be said for the Miz where 
if you make a wrong move in this feud, the Miz falls into obscurity, he falls off this tightrope, and there goes all his momentum. But I don't think right like now is not the time to take the Intercontinental Championship off of Dean Ambrose either. So how does how does this all play out? And I really uh, I can't wait to see how that unfolds, whether it's a positive or a negative thing. Yeah, um, just yeah, I feel the same way about the Wyatt Balor one. Um, and quickly on the uh, I'll, I'll go to Miz Ambrose just because we were just talking about it. You know, I kind of realized that they never quite finished their feud on SmackDown. It kind of like fell. They just kind of. It's true. It kind of just dropped off. And it, it makes me a little sad that Renee Young is still on SmackDown just because I thought the whole angle with Ms. Maurice and then you had Renee Young and Dean Ambrose, like Renee Young obviously wasn't going to wrestle, but the fact that she was kind of involved in a storyline was really, really interesting to me. Do you think they could go back to that after Cena and Nikki Bella, though? Because they kind of like that was yeah, a lead up to it's that. It's true. It's true. And, and that might be why that kind of dropped off because they didn't want to do something too similar so i can see that angle it's just unfortunate because you never see renee young involved in a storyline so that was just very intriguing but i have no doubt that they'll continue to have good promos but you know before the number one contender match even happened like the build up to it on raw so far i thought was pretty good yeah joe Rawl and rollins while I like both of these guys, it kind of I'm still like where I was before payback where I'm like, I should be more excited for this feud, but I'm just not quite there. And I think a lot of that just has to do with I I used to really be digging Seth Rollins, but I just can't find a reason to care right now. I, I just don't know what it's it is. True. He's he's lost a lot of momentum and there's a chance that they could gain it back with this feud. Just have like good, solid matches with Samoa Joe. Because we both know Joe can go. Yeah, it's really just from a character standpoint, We, I just don't really know what to think of Seth Rollins. When he was a heel and was with the authority, you at least knew where like his character was at and what, what he was trying to do and what he was trying to accomplish. And it just, he still feels lost, even though, yeah, he's like the Kingslayer or whatever. It, it's, it feels a little hollow to me. By the way, to to uh, to go into one mode for a minute, do you feel like they could have shoehorned that Jamie Lannister reference in any harder at the oh, end the of Samoa? Hand. Yeah, with yeah. the one handed thing. Like, come on, that's a bit of a stretch, you guys. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, everyone's been watching a little too much Game of Thrones. Hey, it's coming back soon. Only only a couple <gasps> couple more I'm so, months. I'm so excited. Just drip it and just put it in my veins. Drink it in, man. Oh, the gift of thrones. So, moving on to SmackDown Live. So, before we go into SmackDown, confession time. I uh, I did not have an opportunity to watch the blue brand this week. I had some, uh, some commitments come up. So, Ryan, basically, your word is the gospel. So, if you uh, lead me astray... Um, I'm basically going to yell at you next week. So there you go. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll be able to, to summarize what went down. And based on my summary, you, you can give your feedback. And if I feel like maybe I, uh, you know, if, if if I feel like you're going uh, off the rails a bit, I'll, I'll pull you back in. Maybe if, Please do. Uh, it wasn't clear what happened. Guide me. Guide me through this. So it, it's now completely clear that they're positioning Charlotte as a face. So they're really going away from our initial interpretations of when we saw Charlotte go to SmackDown, we thought, OK, she's dominant on Raw. She fought everyone there is to fight. We're going to move it to SmackDown. She'll probably win the title pretty quickly and continue her dominance there. Uh, that still could definitely happen, but it. Uh, it seems like they're taking a little bit of a detour. They're shifting the focus away from the SmackDown Women's Championship at the present moment to really focus on the women's division as a whole, where Natalia, Tamina, even though it doesn't really make sense for her, and Carmella are against this, you know, the way things are going and against the newcomer Charlotte, like, you know, Charlotte comes in, they think she just wants to come in and run the place. So they're kind of like this resistance. 
and uh, Naomi just kind of got bundled into this too by getting attacked. So eventually, and, and Becky had kind of been holding out. Um, okay. So these three women, Natalia, Tamina, and Carmella, were just beating the hell out of Charlotte, beating the crap out of uh, Naomi. And now it looks like now that Becky finally came to the aid of these two, we're heading towards this uh, six woman tag match that I assume will happen at Backlash where these so, two groups will fight against each other. Question. And maybe they didn't explain this. Why are Naomi and Becky Lynch OK with teaming up with Charlotte where she's being like, if Charlotte's going to dominate the women on SmackDown, that includes them. And they're just OK with getting run over, like run over. Well, I see the way it's been going is so far like f- last week. I think, um, if I remember correctly, they beat the crap out of Naomi and Charlotte, but Becky did not get involved. It okay. wasn't until this week. So it's that, because they beat up Naomi and now Naomi wants revenge and then like yeah, her and this Charlotte week, can. Be- like, uh, there was a, a backstage segment with Becky talking to the, the three women. I, I forget what happened, but then when she came out to the ring later, Becky pretended like she was going to join them. But then uh, ended up like she was going to she was like shaking their hands and then she was going to shake Ellsworth's hand, but then like didn't. But then like hugged him instead, but then threw uh, like threw him into the to the group and like started fighting them. The old DDP swerve. Yeah. So it's like Becky was hesitant to join them at first. At least they kind of had that. Um, but anyway, I kind of like that. They're sort of they're taking a step away from, oh, it's just about the title. Like, let's focus on everyone in the division. This is what SmackDown does very well with the women's division is that they try to make everybody in it seem relevant. So I I do like this. And it takes us away from what I thought was going to be just the obvious thing of Charlotte's going to come in. She's going to immediately take the title off Naomi and she's going to do exactly what she was doing on Raw. So even though I'm a little hesitant on Charlotte coming in and becoming a face now because she's so good as a heel. I like that they're not just doing the obvious thing. I mean, this will be a nice test for Charlotte's character, right? Like, is this whole face run going to flop? And uh, that, that'll that be interesting Do to a see. Flare play flop. Out. Woo! I, I appreciate that. Thank you. But <laughs> well, I guess we'll see. I mean, I'm still of the mind that Charlotte should be champion. She should be champion, and maybe maybe that's where maybe that's where this all lands. Where the whole face run is a temporary thing. She turns on Naomi, wins the title, and then we go back to Charlotte at the top of the mountain. But I'm still of the mind where that's what I want to see happen. And I think it will. It's clear it will eventually happen. I just appreciate the fact that they're not rushing towards it. They're gonna kind of let her get acclimated to SmackDown, and they're not just gonna. Go, oh, Charlotte's here. Give her the title. Let's just do what we did before. Like, they're taking a detour, and I appreciate that. And this detour will help build the rest of the division, which I think is a very good thing. So, Shinsuke Nakamura, we we haven't... I don't think we really touched on him last week, where there was that... Are you talking about the artist known as Shinsuke Nakamura? we didn't even talk about that. That that he's... Like, that... That's it. Like Vince McMahon gets in his mind, even though he gets his mind. Oh, he sees Prince. (laughs) He sees Michael Jackson. Now we're going to call him the artist, the artist formerly known as Shinsuke Nakamura (laughs) or whatever. And then Dolph Ziggler cut that uh, promo about like him being Michael Jackson. Jackson. It was just like, and and, and this was last week's Smackdown. Uh, On this week, there was just a promo. He didn't, he didn't wrestle. And uh, Ziggler was just kind of talking to him, talking to random people backstage. So what do you think so far with Shinsuke Nakamura? Is it has it gone smoothly? Is it right to do the what they've done so far? I, I, I get that they want to save his first debut match for Backlash. They want it to be, be a special thing. And I get that. But as far as the rest of the build, kind of having that promo last week, then really not doing much this week. Are you worried about Shinsuke Nakamura on SmackDown? Man, I hope that backlash match is a home run because when Nakamura came to NXT, 
his wrestling did the talking. And I think that is the best part of the Shinsuke Nakamura package, just how great he is in the ring at both, like, as far as moves go and the story that he can tell. And they're kind of steering away from all of that on SmackDown. Like, if you didn't watch NXT, what do you know about Shinsuke Nakamura besides he can't really cut an, a promo too well, honestly, just because of the whole language barrier? It's been a... I think it's been a very rocky start. But that being said, if the Backlash match is everything that they're hyping it up to be, which, by the way, they are setting that bar real high for that match between Nakamura and Ziggler. It's uh, it has potential to not fall flat. But man, I hope I hope it goes well, because up until this point, I can't give it positive praise and it worries me. Yeah, it has definitely been a little shaky. But I, I really hope all will be well. I really feel confident that Ziggler and Nakamura will be able to have a fantastic match. Nakamura's entrance is just so damn cool. I can't not see the crowd getting into it. You know, every it's crowd true. he's every crowd he's come out to has been totally into it. But it's do you just, need... I'm surprised that they're forcing so much mic time on him when it's like, yeah. that's the thing you have to be so careful about. Like, do you need Nakamura around to build that match? Or do you build this presence and then just have Nakamura show up and basically do what he did with Sami Zayn at TakeOver? And just or have even then, an... you know, have Ziggler talk and then Nakamura just starts to beat the crap out of him. Like, that's exactly. all you have to do. Yeah, so it's th- been mm, yeah, it's I don't been know. A, it's been a shaky approach, but backlash will be you know the true. And get the true rid of test. the artist. Get rid of that freaking artist yeah. thing. He's just no, Shinsuke that's Nakamura. Thing, like, when they were talking about having um, Neville be like Mighty the Mouse new, or whatever, yeah, or you the know? new sensation Neville. Oh. It's just one of those dumb things that Vince McMahon got into his head. Which, by the way. Uh, uh, the last thing on our agenda before we get to questions, there is a Vince McMahon movie happening. So I'll be getting to that in just a little bit. And I can't wait. So we know from last week's SmackDown that Breezango became the number one contenders for the SmackDown tag title. So Keith, you're going to have to watch this. It's probably up on the YouTube channel, the WWE YouTube. I've seen a lot the, of hype about the fashion. Uh, the files. fashion. Yeah. So this was a basically law and order parody that Brizango did. And it was it was pretty damn funny. Like, I, I can't really do it justice, but essentially they they go through all of the the fashion um, violations that the Usos had. And Great. it's pretty damn good. There's also this board in the back that has things pinned up there's a lot of like little easter eggs in the back but uh i know the funniest violation that they had when they're talking about the usos they were saying they were walking backstage looking you know dressed bad or something like that and um breeze is like jaywalking and then uh and Fandago's like, and Jimmy walking. Oh, and I was like, oh, man. that was so good. That was so well good. Played. So I, I, I mean, can't do it justice. You just need to Tyler watch Breeze, it. Tyler Breeze and Fandango are such excellent characters. That is easily the best part of their uh, of their like their overall superstar uh, presence. And if they just let them go nuts with that, you could have something really big in Breezango. Yeah, I'm just happy even if this is all we get. I'm just happy that they are finally getting an opportunity to show how funny the, they really are cuz they do let like they do that Zoolander type duo so well and it it, it just works really well and I, I thought this was great. They really need to do more of these. It was awesome. So finally I just like Fondango saying breezy over and yes. over breezy. <laughs> so uh finally to end Smackdown we had Chris Jericho and Kevin Owens face off for the United States Championship. Obviously, Chris Jericho winning the title at Payback and moving to SmackDown. A pretty big shocker because everyone assumed, ah, you know, Jericho's on his on his way out. I think, Keith, you might have called it that Jericho was going to win it. Yeah. So, called it, baby. Ha- hat, is, hat is off to you, sir. I, no, I didn't I, see um, that coming. 
I will take the uh, the technical foul of Kevin Owens staying on SmackDown. I did not call that. Yeah, I, I think that was something that was kind of just said offhand and we, we missed it because yeah. I think we got an email then someone actually explained that to us. So that was yeah, I, I'm glad that that's how it worked out because I think that's the best of both worlds. You get Jer even though Jericho's going away for a while, you got Jericho on to SmackDown and Owens also gets to stay on SmackDown, which I think is a really good thing because of how damn crowded it is on Raw. I can't say it enough. <laughs> so once once Jericho did win the United States Championship, it was kind of obvious. We're getting a rematch on SmackDown. Owens is going to win it back. They don't make floor titantrons and stuff of the face of America, Kevin Owens, and then just have him lose the title. By the way, terrible angle of Kevin Owens, that floor titantron. It makes him look it. like he has a quadruple chin. I honestly, <laughs> I, I love it. I think it's perfect because it's, I like that it's just this unflattering face. Like it's just in your face and it's unpleasant. And I think that's what is so amazing about it. Okay, I, I can see that. I think I it's meant that. to be like that, to be honest. You're just like, oh, like you don't want to look at his face. So it's it's part of the, the heel thing, and I think it's perfect. Um, so obviously, hey, I mean, Baron Corbin beats the crap out of Sami Zayn on Talking Smack, hits a referee, gets suspended for a week, but Kevin Owens can beat the living crap out of Jericho uh, like with a chair and powerbomb the crap out of him, put a chair over his neck, throw him into a ring post, and then what are those words? no suspension. Hold on. What are those words we like to throw around here? Oh, right. Plot convenience. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, um, So because it was not on a official, a non-wrestler, and I guess if it because it happened in the ring area, this is cool. Is Even fair. though last week Corbin did way less harm and got one week suspension mm -hmm. but you know just a I'm, funny thing i'm happy this happened i'm happy that uh because i mean it's it's obvious that jericho is going away for the next little bit and i'm happy that they did this just from like a future planning standpoint because now let's say jericho were to come back and be on smackdown he just wouldn't oh hey show up on smackdown and i yeah, guess chris he jericho's here now now he has a reason to show up and the quick title change and the quick title reign, I think it was worth it for that alone. Yeah, no, I, I liked it. It was a nice way to get another person, uh, get another body on this SmackDown who will be a great asset when he does return. And it'll be, all, you know, like something will be going on with Kevin Owens. He's all high and mighty. And then Jericho is just going to come back and beat the hell out of him. Like, you know, that's happening a couple months down the line whenever Jericho returns. So that will be an, an awesome moment. Agreed. So, lastly, before we get to your but not questions, because I can't wait for I don't know anything yes. about this. Yes. This one's much like SmackDown. This one's all Ryan. And I'm yes. so excited so to go on this ride. A rumored Vince McMahon movie oh, that baby. is be, that it's it's uh, been greenlit and there's like a script. But so you're telling no me final... that uh, they gave it the green light and it's ready to go. Yes, go, go, go. <laughs> oh, we, oh, we, oh, whatever. Um, so as far as I know, there is no final script. So the script is very much in the air. But now it appears like WWE films and Vince McMahon are like taking part in it when before I think they were a little more hands off. But anyway, the, OK, so this is definitely not going to be the final script. But I just want to give you some tidbits of what this original script oh i can't was like. wait i okay. can't wait oh this is gonna be amazing so i got this from a, a report posted by Ma mike johnson on pw insider and he was uh, i guess let's see yeah so i got it from pw insider and here's just some stuff from this uh report so it says, based on those I've spoken with, the script begins in the 1970s with Vince already married to Linda, who is working as a waitress in a nudie bar. All right. <laughs> Frustrated That's by his different... That's a mental image I never needed, but all yes. right. <laughs> um, so his frustration is uh, doubled by the fact when he visits his father, Vince Sr., presented as true, an old-timey wrestling promoter. What? Is that is that real? 
Did Vin, did Linda McMahon work in a nudie bar at I some don't, point? I highly, highly doubt it. I do not think so. All right. So he's got a, a lot of frustrations with his uh, his father, who like curses up a storm in every scene and talks down to his son. And uh, you know his WWF shows, triple WF shows are happening in like half empty buildings and stuff. Um. So uh, his okay. Let's see. Let's There's not a look scene too deep in a that. later draft where Vince is exiled to Bangor, Maine to be a local promoter and is blown away after witnessing Led Zeppelin live in the building, realizing the lesson of how important lighting music are to changing pro wrestling presentation. I don't know if that's true. We're told there's an amazing scene early on where in the nudie bar, Linda tells Vince she is pregnant with Shane McMahon in parentheses. <laughs> and Vince declares the mother of his child won't work in a place like this and they leave. The manager tries to stop Linda from leaving before the end of her shift and ends up in a fight with Vince who trounces him. The script makes it clear that Linda is turned on by what Vince has done. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> this is this is literally written it seems like it's written by Vince McMahon. Hmm. This might be the greatest movie ever. Yeah. Okay. I gotta get... Alright, so there's a, a major change from real life in all the drafts of the script is the idea that Vince Sr. passes away during the McMahon steroid trial, which did not happen. Um, Vince McMahon Sr. passed away before the first WrestleMania, uh, way early than the mid-90s during the height of the McMahon trial. So, alright, I want to find... So there's stuff about like Vince McMahon's infidelities and... and being like a, a highlight, a thing that they show or whatever. Just basically that, um, you know, Vince is getting it from all places, apparently. You know what I my biggest hope for this movie is? Whatever it ends up being is that even though it's like, even though it's not straight truth, they position it as such. Like, this is the story of Vince McMahon. Yeah. And it becomes the truth. It becomes yeah. in, <laughs> what in actually this... happened. Vince McMahon rewrites his own history. <laughs> Seriously. And he would totally do it and just live by it. Yep. And yeah. Anyway, here's here's the good stuff. So lots of names that were featured in WWF are featured in the script. In one sequence, the film portrays that Vince found Junkyard, junkyard Dog as a construction war, worker, Roddy Piper in jail, Jimmy <sighs> Snuka as a porn actor, oh. and transformed them into pro wrestlers. Do Obviously, they, is there any mention like Hulk case. Hogan has to be a big part of this oh, movie, Oh, there is right? something about Hulk Hogan. I, I, will, I will see if I can find that. He, okay, here's a good one. So, um, uh, let's see. There is a scene in which Vince dri drives Linda to Montreal for their anniversary and throws a fit in a French restaurant because he hated their food, leading to the owner coming out and the owner being Andre the Giant. Oh, my God. And that all along the trip was Vince's way of scouting out the giant he had heard of. The idea is that... That Vince uh, then brings Andre into the business. This is like, this is a building the team. Like, this is basically a heist movie. This is Vince McMahon going around and building his team and recruiting his team. Yeah, and I kid you not, check this one out. One version of the script features a scene where Randy Savage and Vince have a conversation about how Savage is popular with young women the same age as Stephanie, leading to Savage telling Vince he would never think of touching her. And question time. Yeah, that'll <laughs> never, that'll never make the light of day. So, okay. We were told that the process is just starting and new writers may be brought into the fold. So there is, um... Yeah, so what happens is basically WWE Studios like just got on board. So another team was working on all this. Now WWE Studios is on board. You better believe that I think most of this script will never see the light of day. Absolutely not. It's going to be <laughs> completely rewritten. Although but some I of hope. these things I could totally believe staying in. Oh, about like, I discovering hope. all the wrestlers. I hope so badly that this movie becomes a thing. I want this movie more than any other it, movie. It is very, very likely becoming a thing. The question is, how 
is it going to be like this? Is it going to be more true? I, I, I don't think Vince McMahon needs all this BS made up to have an interesting movie. I mean, just going into Wrestle, like the first it's WrestleMania so much alone. better if it is. <laughs> I want to see an accurate <laughs> representation, but maybe I'm asking too much. Hollywood Probably. always will take their liberties. I mean, um, they have that sure. out there. There's that Vince McMahon DVD that came out a mi- like a few years ago. Where, like, you know, there was a difference between Vince and Mr. McMahon and all that. I guess that's true. So, we we shall see. And uh, no matter what, it's going to be a movie worth seeing. (laughs) That's for sure. Especially if any of this comes true. Any of the things I just read. (laughs) So, moving on. I think it is time to get to the questions. Yes. (laughs) Yes, it is a nice time to get the questions, which, of course, if you'd like to ask questions for the show, uh, the best way to do so, you can send us an email, bitethatcast at gmail.com. Reach us over Twitter at bitethatcast. Those are the main platforms. You can also catch us through other social media as well. So without further ado, Keith. Yes. yes. The questions. All right. Well, our first question this week comes from the true prince of pro who asks... Do you think they should add Chris Jericho to the United States title match at Backlash, considering there is a break in his upcoming tour with Fozzie? Uh, well, based on how they ended this with the injury with Jericho, I think it's better to just keep him away for a while. Let him do his tour. Let people miss him. He, he had a really, really, really good run. And I'm OK with Jericho kind of stepping away. And especially if he's going to show up for the U.S title match and then he's gonna have to go away again for a while i don't i'd rather he just stay uh stay off the main you know stay off smackdown for a little while plus i'm i'm a big fan of just seeing straight up kevin owens versus aj styles on uh, at backlash i i I like singles matches i agree uh, with your point completely and not only that but if you have jericho come back for that match he probably comes back to lose so what's the point of having that's another back. great point like make if when jericho comes back have jericho come back and it'd be a meaningful thing like you mentioned with kevin owens him uh like kevin owens is on top he's the face of america then all of a sudden jericho comes back beats the hell out of owens and maybe you have another great one-on-one match between the two and there's aj styles versus kevin owens like you don't need jericho in that match for it to be fantastic that's a match that i want to see on its own and uh, to go into, because we mentioned Fozzy, have you heard that new single from Fozzy yet? It's real good. I haven't, but I heard it is going to be the, isn't it going to be the theme for yeah, Backslash? It's, it's the, or it's the theme for NXT TakeOver Chicago. Oh, okay. I, now, I'll have to check it out. Judas. It's worth a, it's worth a listen. It, uh, Maybe it me, I'm your Judas and I'm your priest. Pretty much. <laughs> And we're uh, we're going to break the walls down on that one. So thank you for the question. <laughs> Our next one comes in from Kane Yo-Yo, who asks, what was better? See no evil or the House of Horrors match? So I got to be honest, I have not seen See No Evil. That and makes super, two of us. <laughs> I've been super close to it, too. There's been times and maybe I'm a bad wrestling fan for this, but there's been times where I've been. Sitting, you know, sitting in the TV with some friends and like Netflix, we're scrolling through and someone's like looking for a horror movie and they go and see no evil. And I go, uh, probably no, not. We should probably pick something else. Made a good choice. That makes you a good wrestling fan. And as, our, as far as I'm considered, I'm keep still going to say pure. that see no evil is probably just overall a more enjoyable experience than the House of Horrors match. Yeah, I I've never seen see no evil myself. <laughs> I only know three things about it. May 19th, Kane's name is Jacob Goodnight, and there was a point in the script where Vince McMahon wanted him to kill people with his penis. That's all I know about <laughs> seeing no evil. And it was almost going to be called, like, Ice Cream. Ice yeah, Cream ice Man. Cre- ice Cream Man. Like, your eye, scream, and man. And he has, like, a hook or something. He, yeah. he thinks he's... Um, right, he has a hook. He's, like, stitches or whatever. Yeah, and he like almost used it on the Great Khali one time. So I think my answer for this is Ice Cream Man was probably the better movie. Or match, depending on which one you want to compare it to. (laughs) All right, so thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from Caleb, who asks, 
If you guys could pick one partner to become a tag team with, who would it be and why? There's only one answer, and that is Braun Strowman, so that he could carry my ass and just beat the hell out of everyone. You know, I would be the Enzo of the Enzo and Cass-like tag team, where I'm pretty much useless, and Vince McMahon just likes to see me ragdoll and get thrown around, and then... And this is Braun Strowman, (laughs) and he's a hundred feet tall. (laughs) And, and can't he's teach not that. finished with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. If I live the rest of my life, basically since payback, I've lived my life with a constant loop of Braun Strowman going through an ambulance door on repeat in my mind. And I hope I <laughs> Even the graphic my- that they did. Oh, had so had the good. had Strowman like going through the door again. <laughs> he just It was so good. It makes me so happy. Oh, God, it's so good. But uh. Strowman is a solid pick to uh, to not copy you, but be very similar. I would have to go with Brock Lesnar for almost every reason that you mentioned. <laughs> it can uh, it can we're, apply to we're Brock realistic as well. about our wrestling ability. Indeed, he would carry me to the moon, and I would be there going, "Yep, Brock, here comes the pain." And then Paul Heyman could say nice things about me too, potentially, or crap on me. I'd be cool with that. So thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from Cameron B, who asks, Hey guys, from the current roster, who do you see becoming the first 10-time world champion, if anyone? Um... Roman, Let's see, of the people Ro- who aren't already 10-time champions. Yeah, it's now, Roman, Ro- Roman Reigns, right? Yeah. Wait, did you say where Cameron was from? I didn't hear you. I didn't. You I didn't? rolled right okay. over that one. I want... No, I want to point this out. Okay, Cameron here, he tried to get us, all right? He said he's from Edinburgh, England. And, I, you know, I was smart. I saw this question. I saw Edinburgh, England. I'm like, hmm, I think someone's trying to pull one over on us. Yeah, sure I wasn't, enough, I, I look wasn't, it up. I wasn't going to give him the uh, the time of day on no, that one. Oh, no. I, you, they, they, he was trying to get one. Uh, uh, you know, no, he was trying to get me. I, I oh, read trying this to get shit. You. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I had to catch it. So, Endenburg is in Scotland. He's pulling the old Glasgow, England joke. I get to tip my hat to I tip my fedora to you, sir. I'm not wearing one for real. Don't worry. Um I but I caught that. you. I caught you. Try to put you put one over oh, on us. Oh, use a sneaky, sneaky. Got him. Okay, but it's Roman so, Reigns, right? Like it, it has to be. Um, honestly, already, it could be Charlotte. <laughs> it really could be Charlotte. Oh, but it, that's a. Uh, like, but it says from he the does roster of guys. guys. He does so, say of guys. Okay. Charlotte's probably the answer of the current roster. But as far mm-hmm. as guys go, I think it's either going to be. Roman Reigns or Finn Balor, but Finn Balor is less of a confident answer than Roman himself. Yeah, I think Roman Reigns is the answer. If we were talking about titles aside from the world title, I would have a much different answer. Guys like Kevin Owens and Ambrose are seem to always be like Kevin Owens, especially if you think about it, he's he always has a title. Owens goes very short spurts of time without wearing one belt one way or another. You know, he, he went from NXT Good champ point. to, you know, to Intercontinental champ pretty quickly to, to Universal champ. Like he always he's always carrying a title. It's almost like he's always fighting for a he's, prize. Yes, you might say. Yeah, he, they keep that prize fighter thing relevant. Yeah. Roman Reigns, he's already had. A, is he like a three time champ already? Yeah, or maybe I think two he's time? three. So, yes. yeah, he's already had quite a few short reigns. So, Reigns is going to have many reigns. A lot of reigns for reigns. Yep. Roman reigns. Reigns, reigns, reigns. So, thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from John Sexton, who asks... Sexton Hardcastle. Yeah. Sup, peeps? Hello. My question is, which participant of the game show era of NXT had the most successful career after it? In addition... Do you think that era was a success or a failure overall? Thanks and have a great week. Well, thank you, John Sexton. It's got to be Daniel Bryan, right? I mean, by a mile. (laughs) By a country mile. (laughs) Nobody nobody even can, like, lace up Daniel Bryan's boots as far as this is concerned. Yeah, I mean, he was, what, was he, he was U.S. champ, intercontinental champ. 
And he main evented World WrestleMania. World Heavyweight Champ main evented WrestleMania, won the undisputed, t- well, what was it, the WWE World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 30, which he main evented. He also beat Triple H in the same night without question. Became general manager of SmackDown. Yes, yes. Still current general manager of SmackDown. Yeah, by, no, by a long shot, got to go I with think Dana the, Bryan. The, sec- the only person that comes close after that is Wade Barrett. Because Barrett, like, it wasn't the flashiest career, but Wade Barrett did have a hell of a WWE yeah, run. Yeah, was Ryback also yep. in there? But I would say, like, Ryback had... Ryback and Wade Barrett are kind of opposites of each other, where Ryback had a lot of flashy moments, but if you look at Ryback's whole career, it wasn't really that impressive. Like, the lows were far lower than anything Wade hit, and there was a lot of time with Ryback like he started with a bang and it's easy to see Ryback in a really positive light with that but think about all the time with like Rybaxel and him kind of losing his way the master of the feed me more when he was like (laughs) he was weirdly depressed for a while there on uh on Raw there was a there's a lot of weird moments in Ryback's career where Wade Barrett had a solid run like yes there were lows I will not deny that but Wade Barrett was able to coast at a higher point during his lows than Ryback and like than Ryback basically. And that's my speech. So do we think that the era was a success or a failure? Um I would say that it was probably mostly a failure. I mean yeah. they they still oh well, you know what? I wouldn't call it a failure because if you got people like da- uh, sure they probably would have signed Daniel Bryan and Wade Barrett whatever anyway. Um, But it was it was a it was an interesting platform. But when you compare it to what NXT is now, and I granted they were two very different beasts. Yeah, it's just like you think NXT and you think current NXT versus this and it's not even close to how much more mileage they're getting out of the new NXT versus the game show era. But, I mean, even getting one Daniel Bryan out of it, which is somebody, like I said, they probably would have signed anyway. He was, he had a lot of buzz around his name before NXT. You know, he had done a lot of work on the indies around the world and was very successful. And, I mean, now that I think about it, it is hard to call it a failure. Because if you look at the roster... And you also, you also get the Nexus out of it, right? Like, yeah, you did get the Nexus. And look at how many people from the first few seasons of NXT are still around. You still have people like, maybe they haven't all had the best career, but you have Heath Slater. You have Brian, or Brian, Byron Saxton. You have Titus O'Neil. You have so many people that are still around or had good careers in the WWE. I do think it's hard to call it a failure because... It did work as a developmental platform at that time. Yeah, not everybody was a main eventer, and some people will never be a main eventer, but you still were able to build a roster out of NXT. And yeah, so I mean, from that, guy, it yeah, you can look purpose. at a guy like Keith Slater, who, I mean, Darren he, Young. Ha- yeah, they, they haven't had the best careers ever, but they've been valuable assets to have on the roster. Heath Slater is a guy who's worked with Bret Hart and stuff because he is a dependable guy. That you exactly. can put in the ring with someone to you know he's going to take care of them. And then, you know, obviously he had a cool run with Rhino as tag champs on SmackDown. They they still got plenty of value out of a lot of the guys on, on those early NXT game show seasons. Agreed. So thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from Peter D. Who asks, he's got some WWE logic questions this week. These are always Ryan's favorite. So I'm going to I'm going to mostly point these ones at you, Mr. McNulty. So Peter D. Two questions today. Why wouldn't Apollo Crews ask Titus O'Neil for fatherly help instead of Heath Slater and Rhino? Titus won a father of the year award. Doesn't Titus have the right to be mad about that? I think Titus does have the right to be mad about that. But Apollo Crews, I mean, even if someone won father of the year, right? But based on how they acted, if they were acting the way they acted on Monday Night Raw, the way that Titus has acted, I think it's perfectly fine for uh, Apollo Crews to not trust him. I mean, you can win all the awards you want, but if you're getting weird vibes in person, 
then uh, I don't blame them. But hey, it seems like Cruz is, is buying into it a little more. I like the weekly selfies that have been going on. The first one, it is uh, real Cruz good. wasn't so into it, but it seems like he's catching on. I, You know what? It's kind of the same thing with a Charlotte turning face where you weren't doing anything with the other two anyway. So why not give it a shot and see if it sticks? I mean, we got Slater Gator out of it's almost just funny that, that Titus is a manager when he's so damn tall. Like he's taller than anyone he'll ever manage. But he has the Titus brand. It's all he needs. It's true. Ura, so ura, to, ura, ura, ura. So on to Peter D's second plot question. Did it feel weird to you guys that Orton had Shane McMahon get his title back from him from Jinder Mahal? He is a babyface WWE champion. He should have come out come out to the ring right at the start of the show and demand it, demanded that Jinder bring it back. I can get through this. Instead, they made him look super weak by having the boss go get it for him. To me, it felt like either the title wasn't worth getting or he was afraid of Jinder. It, it devalued the title and himself, in my opinion. Thanks for the amazing podcast from Peter D. Um, so unless I'm missing something, so you guys can correct me if I'm wrong here, but Randy Orton was wasn't present on SmackDown. And unless I miss something with Shane, he only said on Talking Smack that he had retrieved the championship from Jinder. So I, I really don't think with Orton, I feel like they were selling the whole House of Horrors thing by just ha not having Orton show up on SmackDown this week. And it really didn't come off to me like it was a big deal. It was just, you know, Shane took the title back from Jinder and, and it was fine. So, I mean, and you know what? Can you blame Randy Orton? Wouldn't you be intimidated? I mean, you I can't mean, hinder the Jinder right yeah. now. He is unstoppable. He's got it. He got this. He's got the Sing Brothers with him. I mean, that's that's a force right there. Gender has gone from the hindered to the hinderer. You do not want to mess with the hinderer. The it's hindering, true. the hindering is coming. But I agree with you in the way that uh, once once again I mentioned I didn't see SmackDown. But if you didn't have the House of Horrors a couple of nights before, I do think it would have came off weird, but you're having Orton sell the loss and the whole experience of the House of Horrors, so yeah. I think it I mean, makes sense for him segment, not to be around. If there was a segment where Orton went to Shane and said, get the title back for me, Very I'm on different. board. I'm completely on board with you, but that that's not at least what I saw that happen, so I don't have a problem with it. Indeed. And I mean, you make Jinder look strong. By, uh, they gotta make Jinder look strong. He is the hinderer, the hinderer of worlds. Just so, stay stay away from that the, them drug tests, Jinder, and, and you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yep. One day. So thank you for the question. Our final question of the show comes from Benjamin R. Who asks, hey there, guys. Since you don't talk about NXT or 205 Live often on the podcast, I wanted to ask you some questions regarding the topic. Because, you know, we'll be experts on it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys regularly watch NXT and 205 Live? I personally really enjoy 205 Live and think it has improved greatly over the last couple of months. Hashtag Neville, king of the cruiserweights. So, Ryan. Do you watch NXT or 205 Live? I watch NXT TakeOvers. And I have not, I gotta be honest, I've not seen a single episode of 205 Live. I have nothing against it. I'm sure there's plenty to like. And uh, I'm sure the same goes for NXT. But with Raw and SmackDown back to back in days, we got this podcast on Wednesdays. That, uh, and you know, pay per views every Sunday, that is sort of where. I reached my limit with the wrestling I want to watch. If I feel like watching it, I'll definitely tune in. And like, I, I enjoy watching things like Talking Smack and if Bring It to the Table or something is going on, like I'll tune into those. I just haven't felt motivated to watch NXT or 205 Live. And I don't want to watch them just to, like, I want to feel motivated to watch those shows and not watch them just to watch them so i mean they're time investments at the end of the day right yes. so you want to make sure yeah. that it's I a mean, valuable one and they're only an hour and i'm sure it's 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 not too bad but i you know raw and smack raw being three hours really 
kind of kills my spirit for wanting to tune into additional wrestling content. One might call it a hinder. Opinion. Raw hinders everything. It's true. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm kind of in the same way with you where I don't actively seek out NXT or 205 Live, especially as it's current. Uh, as it's current, if I keep like if I'm in a position to keep watching wrestling once SmackDown is done, I'll turn on the network, sure, and see what's going on on 205 Live and talking smack. Uh, so I, I catch some episodes with that. I would say that I catch more episodes than I miss. And with NXT, it's kind of the opposite for me, where I'll keep up. I'll watch clips if they're available. And if I have a free moment and I'm not doing anything, I'll check out some NXT. But I don't feel the passion to actively seek it out that I used to. It's um, It's a bit of a bummer, but it's something that I've come to accept that... I mean, especially for the show, we focus on Raw, we focus on SmackDown. Those are the choices I've made. That is how I consume my wrestling content for the week. Some may call that better, some may call that worse. <laughs> I have my opinion that I'll keep to myself. But that's, you know, that's just kind of the way it is for me. But um, I always try, yeah. and I always I mean, try to watch <laughs> the takeovers. The takeovers are what, like, yes, absolutely. Yes, I'll, I'll always tune into a takeover, but it, it's crazy, like, oh, you know, if if people are like, why don't you watch NXT or 205 Live? I mean, if you think about it, if it's a pay-per-view week, we're already watching close to eight hours of wrestling, which I know is still the length of like one WrestleMania now, but like... That's not that's, a good thing. That is so much more than almost any other TV show that you want to follow would demand, unless you were religiously watching every baseball game that a baseball team was playing. That's like, oh, you know, or, you know, some of the other sports... But most of those, it's like you don't have to worry about storylines in sports. So if you miss the game, you can just look at the score and move on with your life. Exactly. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult to do that with wrestling. Um, so, yeah, it's just the truth is if if WWE wasn't already so much of a commitment, I would definitely be more inclined to check out some of the more additional shows, especially considering I used to really, really love NXT back in like 2013 and just kind of fell out of it uh, because I... I like other things besides wrestling, so on other days, that's I tend to spend my time doing other things. Agreed. Now, Benjamin R. has a second part to his question, and this is going to be real fun. Could you quickly comment on some of the following NXT or 205 Live wrestlers and give your opinion on them? If you see potential in them or what you think of their current program slash storylines... So we're going to lean more on the potential side, I think, on this one. I mean, I've seen all of these guys in one form or another. So So we we have somewhat of an opinion. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to we're going to stick to the potential part because I I agree where I can also say um, I have an opinion on the potential side. So we'll go through these quickly, starting with Eric Young and Sanity. So I I, from what I've seen of Sanity, I dig them. I like their whole primus inspired uh theme song and i like their look they remind me of a of a certain team that we create in our little video game league but yeah i think they're really cool i like nikki cross i think it's cool that they have a woman a part of their faction just as just another participant essentially and not as like a valet like she's a legit part of the faction which i think is really cool I agree. I think from what I watch of NXT, Sanity is my favorite part of the show. And I love them so much that I'm afraid for them to go to the main roster just in case it all falls apart there. And I have to agree with your points on Nikki Cross. I I love her. She is my favorite part of the show. I think that Nikki her, Cross is Bay for Nick, Keith. Nikki Cross is Bay. Just the um, the different take she has on a female uh, a female competitor. I think is I I welcome it so much, and I pray it doesn't fall apart on the main roster one day. Our next one, Cassius Ono. Oh no! Oh no! Uh, Cash Sono, I mean, I was, when I started watching NXT, he was, this was when he was on for his first run. Uh, I, I'm a fan of the guy. He's got an, he's got a hard hitting style. He moves really well for a guy his size. I mean, everyone complains that, uh, he's got a gut or whatever, 
But, uh, you know, I'm a fan of the guy and whatever, you know, if he's a good wrestler, he's a good wrestler. So, you know, maybe sometimes he just has to wear it like I saw him in kind of the basketball jersey, like attire. Like, just find something that suits your form a little better. Like, Kevin Owens is a big guy, but he wears something that suits him. So it's not in your, it's not it doesn't take away from the experience. So really just I don't know if he's changed his gear since, but Ono is an amazing talent and just. Uh, find better gear. Agreed. Um, I don't know if Ono will ever win the big one in NXT. He, I can kind of see him going the uh, the Baron Corbin, Tyler Breeze route where he's just like a top guy but never is champion. And um, that goes well for people on the main roster, right? <laughs> Usually. So, um, Ono? On to our next one, and very similar in my eyes, Hideo Itami. So Itami, I, I've even though he's been around for like years now, I still feel like I haven't seen enough to like gauge him because he just keeps getting injured. And I, I haven't been watching NXT TV, so I'm not seeing if he's doing regular TV matches or whatever. But it seems like not to like throw him in like not to corner him and compare him to someone just because uh you know i'm gonna bring up shinsuke nakamura let's be honest and i was i was about to do the same thing like uh you you know how wwe is with with people and it's like when you have two japanese guys and both of them are hard-hitting strikers but then you have shinsuke nakamura who is he's just more wwe friendly whereas Hitami doesn't have that same... And to be blunt, I think from what I've seen of their bodies of work, Nakamura's better. Yeah, so I'm not going to make a firm decision on that just because I I haven't seen enough to, to make, you know, to make that call. But based on just like how WWE perceives things, it's like Shinsuke Nakamura. He's going to be the guy who will end up being more successful just because he's a flashier a guy. He's he's got the personality. It's, he's just oozing charisma. Whereas Atami is more of like a soft spoken, straight to business, hard hitting guy. And I think they're both very talented. But as far as like who's going to be more successful in WWE, you look at both these guys and you go, it's probably going to be Nakamura. Doesn't mean that Atami won't find success. I agree. Um, to put it bluntly, and this is no disrespect to Atami, but in a post Nakamura world, I don't think he has a hope in hell. So on to our next one: the Arthur's or authors <laughs> of pain, the DWs of pain. Um, <laughs> God damn it! These guys impressed the hell out of me. So I hadn't seen too much of them, but watching their their role in that um, was a triple tag team match at Takeover yeah. WrestleMania weekend. I thought they played their roles really well. These guys just know how to be a big man tag team and whoop some ass. So I I really dig them. Yep, they are an incredible big man tag team and they fit that so well. And the whole uh, the whole aura of Paul Ellering with them is just so good. I think Authors of Pain have a have they have a real shot on whether they go to like raw or smackdown they have a real shot at being a big presence there all right now on to the 205 live side of things akira tozawa i like him he's got a kill bill theme song and i don't know i really don't have too much to say on tozawa like he he, i i just i really don't have too much to say i'm sorry i i it's I okay. Kinda it's okay. Sometimes you don't, don't need pay an opinion on as everything. much attention to two hundred five live matches as I maybe should. So I don't want to. I don't want to like go all in on uh, on an opinion. Yeah. No. That's that's fair. For me, Tazawa, he's an incredible wrestler. Um, <laughs> I critiqued Akira Tozawa back in the Cruiserweight Classic, where to me he looked like. He looked like a certain type of wrestler that I was not into, but over time I've kind of uh I kind of mellowed with his style and that kind of stuff. But in a world where you have people like Neville, Austin Aries, uh Brian Kendrick, 
on top of the cruiserweight division. I don't know if Tozawa hangs at the back or like at the end of the day as somebody that could be cruiserweight champion because you've got people that are so good. And um, I think there will come a time where he, at the end of the day, he will be known for having some great matches. I don't know if he will be known for having a great title run. On to the next one. The Brian Kendrick. The Brian Kendrick. I mean, he is a great veteran and an asset to have in the cruiserweight division. The definition of work smarter, not harder. I think he's uh, he's great. And he's, you know, maybe he's, he's not going to be the guy who's going to hold all the glory in the cruiserweight division. But he's just a valuable asset to be working with a lot of the younger guys and, you know, showing them the ropes, essentially. Agreed. Brian Kendrick will probably be known for the cruiserweight division as the guy who built the stars. Everybody that's gone up so far has had incredible matches, prob- with the exception of Neville, has had great matches with Kendrick along the way. And he'll probably get another title run, but he'll, kind of like Tozawa, he'll be known for the great matches. And now our final one, Mustafa Ali. So I haven't seen a ton of this guy, but I do know that he was the victim of beach ball mania because they gave this guy... Like, they let him and Neville just, you know, go at it. And they gave them, like, like two, probably, what, like 20 minutes yeah. to have an awesome match. And they were going all out. And they were having a good match. But Beach Ball Mania was going on. And I feel bad because I was really, I was in. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> like, I do feel bad. But I was, like, enjoying the whole Beach Ball Mania thing because I was embracing the chaos that was the Raw After Mania so nobody was really paying attention to this guy in Neville, and I feel bad. So I, I was like, wow, this guy's definitely got more going on than I thought, and I don't know. So he's definitely got potential. Yeah. For me, it kind of doesn't, ma- doesn't matter what happens with Mustafa Ali. I'll always have beach ball mania, and he will have that <laughs> association. So he's peaked as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> That'll be his legacy. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Bite That Podcast. We want to thank all of you for tuning in. A few quick things for our uh, BT Weekly Update. Uh, We mentioned before, we're not directly associated with this, but there is WrestleThon going on May 19th through the 21st. It's going to be a 48-hour Uh, marathon for the child's play charity so it's for a good cause where they're essentially going to be playing wrestling video games that's over at twitch.tv slash wrestlethon so big ups to them as i mentioned last week i won a cool prize from them that one entered for me so good guys over there we just wanted to throw them a plug because uh it's a it's a really cool thing and we we like video games we like wrestling it's a great combination also you want to look sweet. You want to avoid the 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 fashion police. You don't want to end up on uh, Brizango's uh, ticket or whatever. Get a bite that T-shirt over at whatamaneuver.net. Yeah. We also got a new design coming down the line. So we'll keep you guys updated when that is out. We're also getting super close to our second Patreon goal where we will have a, a second audio feed with more content as well as doing a Patreon Q&A video for everyone to enjoy. So if you want to uh, support us for as little as a dollar a month, you get the Ron Uncut video version of the podcast, which includes a exclusive pre-show. You can head over to patreon.com slash bite that. As I mentioned before, if you want to see my full payback review where I go match by match, you can head over to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash bite that cast to see my full take on the show. And we are approaching the very special episode 200 so close. of Fight That. So close. So we want to make that special. If there's something you want to see for episode 200, within reason, make sure to tweet us, send us an email, let us know what you would like to, uh, to see on episode 200 to just make it that much more awesome. There's also going to be a giveaway that's going to be happening and the winner will be announced on episode 200. So Ooh. stay tuned for details on that. There's a little teaser. A teaser. Oh, a tease. Teaser. And uh, another way to, uh, if you want to help us out, 
whatever platform you listen to us on, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, uh, make sure to give us a, a review. Rate us five stars if you really like the show. That really goes a long way in helping more people find us, spreading the word, spreading the love that is Fight That. So we appreciate that. So thank you guys for tuning in and listening. And we will see you next week. Bye-bye.